This is another video about 2.4, about pseudoprimality in Stein's number theory book. In the first video, we looked at the pseudoprimality theorem, which was a way to characterize what prime numbers look like. It was a little bit inefficient. And so a more practical primality test, in other words, way to test the numbers prime, is called the Miller-Raven test. And essentially what it does is it does the same kind of thing. Um, it's going to figure out whether a number is, well, prime or not, uh, or more generally, probably prime, probably prime. And there's also a certain probability of correctness that goes up with each successive call. So it's pretty unlikely that it's going to um, incorrectly call a composite a prime multiple times. The algorithm itself isn't so hard, and I'll do a couple examples to demonstrate how this algorithm for the Miller-Raven primality test works. Uh, but the proof, however, is a little bit more involved, and it utilizes some results from later sections in the book. And rather than jump to those sections now, um, we'll, we'll just skip over the proof of the, the uh, primality test here, the Miller-Raven primality test. But uh, what's going on? So let's take a look at this algorithm for a minute. What's it doing? So we're going to take an integer that's at least 5, and it's going to either, the end of this output, the end of this algorithm is going to spit out true or false. If it spits out true, then whatever your n is, is probably prime, with high probability. Uh, and if it outputs false, then the integer is definitely composite. And again, this is that idea of pseudo-primality. Probably prime versus it can always tell you if it's composite. So how does the Miller-Raven test actually work? The first thing we're going to do is split off a power of 2. You're going to take your n, and we're going to look at n minus 1. And I want to rewrite n minus 1 as 2 to the k times m, where m is specified to be an odd number. And when you specify m to be an odd number, it turns out the m and the k, such that k is the power on 2, and that m is odd. It turns out those are unique. Uh, what else are we going to do? The next step, after you have this representation of n minus 1, you're going to just randomly pick an integer between 1 and n. We'll call that integer a. And then what we'll do is we'll set b equal to the a you randomly chose, and you'll raise it to the nth power, where the m is this odd here, such that n minus 1 is 2 to the k times m. And you're going to reduce this uh, exponential, or this power, a to the m, reduce it mod n. At this point, if your power a to the m, which we're calling b for simplicity, if that is equivalent to plus or minus 1 mod n, uh, also remember too, that's uh, when you're minus 1 mod n, that's the same thing as n minus 1. Um, if it's equivalent to either of those two numbers, then output true, and then you're done. So the Miller-Raven test would say your number n is probably prime. So what if it's the case that you get a b that's not equivalent to plus or minus 1? Then you move to step 4. Now you start looking at all of the even powers of your b. And by the way here, think about your exponent rules. If b is a to the m, you would multiply m and 2r. So this looks like a to the 2r times m which looks an awful lot like these. And what are these r's? r's are any number between 1 and k minus 1. So anything less than k that's uh, bigger than 1. And what you're going to check is, is each of those equivalent to negative 1 mod n? If the answer to that's yes, then your number n is probably prime. And that's why it says output true and you're done. Otherwise, if you get one where it's not true, then you output false. In other words, that's what determines if your n is composite. So let's go ahead and look at maybe a concrete example. We'll do two concrete examples off to the side, just trying to illustrate steps one through four here for the algorithm. And we're going to play dumb, and we're going to pick small numbers, because that's how my brain works. It likes small numbers. So let's say n equals 11. And let's pretend that we do not know that 11 is a prime number. So let's use the Miller-Raven test in order to figure out, is 11 probably prime, or is it definitely composite? And so the first step is I'm supposed to split off the power of 2. So what we're going to look at is n minus 1, which would be 10. And I want to write that as, remember, 2 to the k times m. And m has to be odd. So in that case, k has to be 1 and m has to be 5. So those are my only choices for k and m. Okay, so now that I've got my k and my m, part 2 is I'm supposed to just randomly pick an integer uh, between 1 and uh, 11. So I'll just randomly pick something. Let's say a is 6. So I've got my 6. And what do I do? I go to step 3, and I'm going to take 6 to the mth power, so 6 to the 5th. And so for 3, I'm going to look at b equals 6 to the 5th power, because remember 5 is my m, and I'm going to reduce that 
uh, mod 11. So let's see, let's think about six to the fifth mod 11. Six to the fifth, I'll do this off to the side. That's six squared times six squared times six. Six squared is 36, uh, mod 11 is three. So that's three times three times six. That is 54, uh, mod 11 is negative one. So what do I got? I've got B is equivalent to negative one mod 11. And if we think about, hey, check this out. As soon as you get B is equivalent to plus or minus one mod N, I'll put true and terminate. In other words, we can conclude at this point that 11 is probably prime. So that's how the Miller-Raven test works in that case. Let's erase this one. I guess I'll just go below it, why not? Let's do another example though. Let's pretend, new example. So I'll call this example one. That's like what a good teacher would do. And someday I'll learn. Let's call this example two. Let's take N to be 15. All right, so let's go through our same steps. And again, we're playing dumb here. I don't know that N is composite. Let's pretend, it's fun. Okay, one, what are we gonna look at? So we're gonna look at N minus one, and I wanna rewrite it as two to the K times M, or I just wanna make sure M is odd. So 14 is N minus one. And if it has the form two to the K times M, well, K has to be one and M has to be seven in order to be 14, those are my only choices. So K equals one and m equals seven. So those are my choices here. Now, same as before, I'm gonna randomly pick a number a, and I feel like picking a equals four. So just any random number that's less than 15, between one and 15. So I am, again, at step two, which is this part here. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a new number b, which should be our four, which is my a. We're gonna raise four to the mth power, so four to the seventh, and we'll reduce that mod 15. And let's do that off to the side. So four to the seventh, that is four cubed times four cubed times uh, four. And uh, four cubed is 64 mod 15. You would have four left over. So this is four times four times four, which is 64 again, which should be four. So B is equivalent, should be equivalent to four mod 15. And we're looking, okay, where I'm at in the algorithm. Okay, so I didn't get plus or minus one mod 15. Well, let's go to the even power step then. Where, what are these R's again? R is anything between one and K minus one. All right, let's think about what's my K. K itself is one. So R has to be between one and zero, which is silly. I can't have zero on this side, which tells me here I can't do anything there. So I didn't get anything. So what happens? I have to output false, right? I'm in the otherwise boat. Right, in that case, I can't do anything. There is no such R. So otherwise, output false. So we get big fat false here, and we have, again, 100% determined that n, is, n equals 15 is a composite number. So that's kind of the gist of how the Miller-Raven test works. Again, skip the proof of that. If you're into some computer science stuff, the next paragraph is kind of interesting. Maybe you know some things about uh, the different speeds at which algorithms work, and um, polynomial time is pretty fast, and uh, Anyway, it's fairly recent that there was a polynomial time primality test that was found, and the author gives a good reference to that if you want to look into it. And it also gives a much more detailed reference, uh, much more detail about the Miller-Raven test and just pseudo-primality tests in general. Um, if you check out this reference, again, which you can find in the index of Stein's number theory book that we're looking through right here. Um, what we want to do is shift gears a little bit and look at one more type of test. And I want to look at this because it's something that I'll have you do in Sage. And it gives me an opportunity too to talk through maybe a little bit of structure and computer science that you'll see a little bit more often in this class. So to do something like maybe run a function on a bunch of numbers at once, what's a good way to do that is called a for loop. And the way that we're going to kind of um, explore that topic is let's look at the is prime function which maybe you remember what does it do you do is underscore prime and you put a number in like seven and it's going to spit out uh, true or false and so is prime seven if you run that in sage it should spit out true okay so what am I going to do I'm going to play with remember what the Mersenne primes were and it gives you a reference for that but remember Mersenne primes were like two to the p minus one whenever that's prime. And this P, it's suggestive, P itself is a prime. Remember, I'm not always saying that expressions of this form are guaranteed to be primes. I'm just saying when such an expression is prime, the name it a Mersenne prime. So what this little, uh, this little loop does, we'll call it a for loop here, 
four is a special computer science word. It's like special syntax. And what it's going to do is it's going to print me a whole list of things. So how should you read this? I'm trying to erase stuff. There, I finally did it. I finally successfully erased some highlighters. So for each P in the list of primes up to 100. So for all the primes that are less than 100, what we're going to do is we're going to check if. So if is another special word. It's kind of like this uh, function's probably the wrong word, but I'm not a computer scientist. But again, it's a special kind of logical operator here. So if the following, I'm going to run my is prime function on all these expressions that look like 2 to the p minus 1. So like uh, for this, this cycles through all the primes. So it starts at 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, blah, blah. The next line, notice there's, uh, there should be a little bit of indent. Actually, you know what? You know what would be better? Let me just write this out myself because you can see my screen. So what I'll do is I have Sage pulled up. Here we go. Cool. Just so you see how this looks like. It's a little bit hard to tell from the book sometimes um, when there's indents. And um, it's very, some the syntax is very picky about index. What we'll do is something like 4p in primes 100. We should always have a colon after this for statement here. And notice when you press enter, it automatically does an indent. That's good. So now we're going to do if. Um, we're going to run our function or call our function is prime p or we'll do 2 to the p minus 1. So remember, I'm just playing with the Mersenne primes. So if I, if I call that thing, and when I write it that way, it's automatically just going to assume like that it spits out true. Notice I put another colon also. That's the property of this if statement here. What do I want it to do? So if this is the case, I want it to print what was the prime p and also tell me what the corresponding Mersenne prime is. And so what we're going to do is we're going to list, you know, the first few Mersenne primes that we know about. So I'm going to try and run this now. And as always, you cross your fingers and hope you didn't like forget a comma or like a colon or a parenthesis. But hey, it works. And I think I get the same output as the book. So I get on the left is the P. So the left column is just, you know, the P and uh, the right column are the numbers two raised to the power minus one. And so those are the first, again, few Mersenne primes, which again, max what the match what the book is doing. All right, so we've run into the Mersenne primes before. It would be nice if there was maybe a way to check out is two to the P minus one, is that thing prime? And it turns out that there is such a thing. It's called the Lucas Lemur test. And I just wanted to show you what that looks like in Sage. And so it's a pretty simple algorithm too. That's pretty fast. And I'll show you what I mean by pretty fast towards the end of this video. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just show you what's the Lucas Lemur test look like in Sage. So I'll get rid of this. So if you're gonna do Lucas Lemur, uh, it should look like this. So def, we're about to define a function and we're gonna define this thing, which will check via the Lucas Lemur test is a number P prime. So the input to this function is P and I just tried to name it something where, oh, I'm gonna use Lucas Lemur to check if this thing's prime. Okay, so we're defining this function. Notice again, after the colon you have, it's automatically gonna indent here. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna write exactly what the book has. So S equals uh, mod, Notice that's a capital M. Also, I'm pretty bad about putting spaces in, but I think maybe it's more readable if I do. So I want four comma two to the P minus one. So I'm gonna look at the element four in the ring, Z mod two to the P minus one Z. So I've set an element, I named it S. And now I'm gonna write this little for loop. So for I in range three up to P plus one. So it really goes up to P. Remember, you don't include the right end point. Since it's a for statement, you put the little colon at the end. When you push enter, you get another little indent and you're on the right track. We're actually gonna uh, set s equal to s squared minus two. And now I'm going to backspace a little bit and try to align this right underneath the four, which is somewhere like right there. And I'll have return s equals equals zero. So now what we'll do is let's make sure that this works. So let's try is prime Lucas Lemur uh, let's do what the book does. It was 9941. Remember, maybe I'll put a comment. What does this do? This checks if 2 raised to that power p, 9941 minus 1, is prime. And if I run it, it spits out true. So, yes, 2 raised to the 9941 power, subtract 1 off that huge number that should be a prime number. Um, now, maybe what I'd like to do is to show you maybe how fast that works. And so if you know some Python, um, 
you've probably noticed a lot of the Sage syntax is very Python-like. Uh, in Sage, we've also got the time it, the time it function, which I'm going to do time it. And this is just for you computer science folk who want to see maybe how fast do some algorithms work compared to some other ones. So time it, I'll do that same calculation is prime Lucas Lemur, um, Lucas Lemur 9941. Notice I write that as a string there. That's what the time it function wants. And I'll run it and I'll wait for it. It should give me something. All right, finally, so it gave me something. So it did five loops and it told me the best of three and it looks like in the best of three, it took 1.04 seconds to actually compute that number here. Now, what I invite you to do is, you know, the other algorithm that I had built in the Sage was is prime two to the 9941 minus one. I'm not gonna do it because I did it earlier just to check it out. But if you tried to run that, it won't do it at all. The is prime function is not efficient enough in order to calculate whether or not this very, very large number is actually prime or not. So this Lucas Lemur somehow cuts through a lot of the nonsense. Uh, it's just a much more efficient algorithm. But again, it really only works to check if these numbers of the form two to the p minus one are actually prime.